Uh, good morning and welcome to the Policy Change event on Securing Europe's Future Competitiveness. Um, now, our, um, I always think it's sort of better to be busy rather than sort of bored at work, but our guest speaker today has arrived in his new job with an absolutely exploding inbox. Uh, we have a discussion about potential future treaty change and economic governance. Uh, we have the beginning skirmishes of the debate over the EU's next financial perspective, the next seven year budget. Uh, we have some very important discussions going on about uh, finance, the Financial Services Action Plan, and about uh, again, environmental policies. Uh, not content with all this, um, David is steering uh, the referendum block, the new referendum block through Parliament. And uh, particularly as of tomorrow, we will be having a big debate about the future of the single market and when Michel Barnier um, releases his package uh, described as the Single Market Act, which has a sort of <coughs> familiar ring to it from somewhere. Um, David uh, doesn't really need any introduction to you. His, I know, doing some research on my employees, and his, his uh, Roth profile describes him as a, quote, highly intelligent, civilized, and articulate young politician. Um, a, bit, a description <laughs> so good, you wonder if money has changed hands, or if they're very good friends. <laughs> uh, and Wikipedia, the fact of all knowledge, also reveals, um, as well as you know, uh, advising various um, various roles in his role in Nolan Island as, as shadow before. He is also a champion on University Challenge. Um, so I'm tempted to open with some kind of very cheesy introduction to say we're going to start up a tennis, you know, to build Europe single models, something like that. But no, um, it is wonderful um, to be able to introduce him to you, David Lennington. Thank you. Neil, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It was, it's it's, it's uh, actually quite a dangerous precedent for a politician because the secret of winning University Challenge is to hit the buzzer when you think you may know the answer, but before you're certain that you do so, and hope that in the half second allowed, the answer will propel itself from the recesses to the forefront of your brain in time to give Paxo the, or the Bamber originally, the, uh, the answer that they want. Um, you know, we, we agree I should talk about securing Europe's growth. And I wanted to talk about this because one of the things that I have found frustrating coming in as a new minister is this consciousness that for far too long the European Union has been obsessed with a navel-gazing conversation about its own internal working uh, and constitutional arrangements and has at times appeared to ignore the fact that outside the walls of the Berlin Mall or the Justice Lipsius building or the European Parliament, the world in particular, the economic balance in the world, has been changing rapidly and dramatically. We're now two years from the collapse of Lehman Brothers. The economic recovery remains fragile. All EU member states have begun to take concerted action to tackle high deficit and debt levels. And those actions are necessary and indeed laudable steps towards securing a return to growth. But the whole of Europe needs to implement the measures which enable it to continue that march back towards fiscal sustainability if, as a continent, we're going to be able to reduce long-term unemployment, if we're going to be able to continue to afford comprehensive systems of social security, and if we're to meet the challenges and also seize the opportunities of increasingly rapid globalisation. Now, in Britain, last week the government laid out detailed plans in the Comprehensive Spending Review for how we plan to balance the books. The United Kingdom has the biggest black hole in its public finances of any European country, and when this government came to power, the IMF was forecasting that UK government borrowing would be the highest level in the entire G20 this year. The fiscal consolidation plan that the government has embarked upon will put debt on a declining path, which is critical to restoring market confidence and to keeping interest rates for business low, and therefore also critical to our prospects for growth. The spending review has set out how the government will carry out Britain's unavoidable deficit reduction plan. It cuts out waste, 
and makes the very difficult choices that will allow us to invest in healthcare, education, national security, and in infrastructure that supports economic growth. But in the medium term, we're going to need further rapid action right across Europe to adjust our 20th century social and economic models to the 21st century challenges of ageing societies, the transition to low carbon, and the growing commercial, technological, and political power of the emerging economies. If both the United Kingdom and our European partners are to emerge stronger from this crisis, we need to turn our minds now to how and where European citizens and institutions could best collaborate to make that transition successful. Now, the government is committed to working within the European Union to champion policies that promote economic growth. We see this as essential to our own <coughs> domestic objectives of boosting Britain's trade and competitiveness, and also because we're convinced that those priorities are the right ones for Europe as a whole. Britain's is a global economy <coughs> with worldwide trading links strengthened by long-established traditions of economic liberalism and openness. We want to see those wider global trading links grow further, but we recognise too that Europe is going to remain our most important market and a more competitive, a more dynamic EU economy is in the interests of every family and every business in our own country. Roughly three and a half million jobs in the UK, 10% of the workforce are linked directly or indirectly to the export of goods and services to other EU countries. Our European partners account for approximately half of both the UK's imports and exports. European countries provide eight of Britain's top 10 main export markets. For example, we are exporting more to Ireland alone than to Brazil, India, China, and Russia put together. Other European states are also the main source of foreign direct investment with 49% of the total coming from these countries. In 2009, service industry exports to the EU alone were worth 63 billion pounds up from 31 billion in 1999, and of course the <coughs> services that account now for 70% of UK employment. <coughs> EU foreign direct investment stock in the UK accounts for half the total stock of FDI here and continues to grow. The single market has been, and it will continue to be, an incredibly valuable asset to this country and its creation was a triumph for Margaret Thatcher and her generation of British policymakers in Europe. Growth in Britain and growth in the EU are inextricably linked. Although Europe overall has now returned to growth, with the Commission forecasting growth of 1.8% in 2010, there are significant divergences between Member States which that average figure risks concealing. So while Germany and Poland are forecast to grow this year by 3.4%, the economies of Spain, Ireland, Greece and Cyprus are expected to continue to contract. More fundamentally, the European Commission estimates the potential growth rate of the euro area of Denmark, Sweden and the UK will be cut in half in 2009 to 2010 compared with 2008 from a growth rate range of 1.3 to 1.6 percent for those countries to 0.7 to 0.8 percent. In sum, and as a result of the financial crisis, the EU economy will have lost over 2 trillion euros of potential income between 2007 and 2013. And the point is that this contrasts sharply with what is going on elsewhere in the world. The IMF estimates that emerging and developing countries will grow at 6.5% in 2011 compared <coughs> to just 1.5% in the Eurozone. At the same time, the growth of the working age population in Europe has practically fallen to zero and is predicted to turn negative in coming years. According to European Commission estimates, that ageing demography 
is going to require additional government expenditure, <coughs> equivalent to as much as 3% of GDP across the EU by 2035, as governments spend a greater proportion of national income on health care and on social security. And these are not <coughs> trends that are simply derived from an economic crisis which began in 2008. No European government can afford to be complacent in the face of what are very disturbing long-term economic trends. But the truth is that during the last decade, not just the emerging economies of Asia and Latin America, but also the economy of the United States have outstripped Europe at an ever-increasing pace. In the last 30 years, EU growth has exceeded US growth in only nine, and emerging and developing countries in just two years. The IMF now forecasts that European Union growth will be outpaced by both the United States and the emerging economies for the entire duration of the current IMF forecasting period right up to 2015. Europe today is starting to resemble 18th century Venice, a glorious past built on buccaneering enterprise and command of international trade, beautiful buildings, fantastic achievements in the arts and sciences, a reputation for civilization, wealth and culture. But now the entrepreneurial spirit has ebbed the trade routes have been grabbed by others. The place is looking inwards. The paint is peeling and the canals are beginning to stink. And if we fail to take action now to arrest and reverse Europe's decline, we shall leave the next generation the prospect not just of relative, but of absolute decline in their living standards and their expectations. And why has Europe got into this state? I want to focus very briefly on what seem to me to be three key reasons. Productivity, labour markets and regulation. European productivity has stagnated in recent times. Let me set out the scale of the problem. In the 1990s, our productivity, Europe's productivity vis-a-vis -vis America's was growing. It reached 90% at the United States level by 1995. But by 2008, those productivity gains had slowed and the gap with America was widening again. To match historic rates of GDP growth, Europe needs to accelerate its year-on-year -year productivity gains by no less than 25%. Europeans also continue to suffer the effects of deeply inflexible labour markets. Now, this problem has often been diagnosed over the last two decades, but it has simply not been adequately addressed. A recent McKinsey report estimates that Europeans work on average <coughs> five weeks less per year than people do in the United States. The participation of older workers, that's 51 to 64, in the labour market stands at 51% compared with 65% in America. Fewer women work full time, absences from work are longer, and unemployment has remained persistently 2.5% higher. And of course, in some European Union countries, those unemployment totals will be much worse still. And that's despite more than a decade of European Union labour market reforms under the banner of the Lisbon Agenda. And finally, on regulation, businesses continue to be hamstrung by ineffective, bureaucratic and overly burdensome, burdensome European Union rules and the appetite, notably in the European Parliament, as we've seen in the vote on the Pregnant Workers Directive this week, still uh, inclines towards more ambitious regulation uh, rather than towards encouraging enterprise. <coughs> now, what should be done? Growth is not going to come from relying on government spending, least of all in these times. Given high and rising debt and deficit levels across much of Europe, we can't continue to rely on the public purse. Instead, we need to focus on creating the conditions for businesses and individuals to prosper through a relentless focus on structural reforms 
carried out at both national and European level. Now often those reforms are not going to be particularly headline racking. <coughs> Rather they're going to be slow, steady and incremental, but they are necessary and if properly executed, I believe they can reverse what many outsiders see as an otherwise inexorable process of European decline. As many commentators have noted, crisis can also be turned to opportunity. All EU member states have felt pressure from the markets to reform their economies to make possible sustainable growth. <coughs> Somewhat ironically, the country that is now grasping the challenge of deregulation most energetically is Greece. Under pressure from the IMF and from its European partners, the Greek government has embarked on one of the most radical reforms in modern history to, produce, to boost its productive potential, freeing up areas of the services sector which historically have been cushioned against competition. So for example, the opening up of Greece's closed trucking market, which is competition, will allow the entry of new companies and provide for lower freight costs, which will benefit both businesses and consumers. And these reforms are now set to be replicated right across the Greek professional classes, with pharmacists, architects and lawyers subject to similar liberalising measures. And I think we need to see the degree of political will that the Greek government is now demonstrating matched by governments across the European Union. The last thing, however, that Europe needs is yet another grand overarching strategy which serves as a substitute for the hard-headed shaping and implementation of detailed policy. The Lisbon strategy for growth and jobs had all the ambitious objectives that you would want. But what happened in practice was not a resurgence of European innovation and enterprise, but more than a decade of European decline compared with the rest of the world. What Lisbon showed was that strategic declarations are impotent if not followed through. And the lesson I draw is that policy coordination at the EU level works best when it provides political momentum to reform within individual member states, and that this is where Lisbon failed to make a difference. I fear that Lisbon, the Lisbon strategy's successor, Europe 2020, has continued with a target-driven approach of which the British government is frankly highly sceptical. The UK's new performance management framework for government departments moves away from this top-down approach to a bottom-up approach based on transparency where information is provided for the public to judge success. Of course, there are some elements of Europe 2020 that we can welcome, such as sharing best practice and examining bottlenecks to growth, and these should indeed be encouraged to help improve the national political ownership of reforms within member states, but they're not in themselves going to generate the economic growth that we need. The EU does, though, have at its disposal three clear levers which could quickly and significantly advance our prosperity. The single market, better regulation of that market, and the Commission's competence on trade. The single market is the EU's greatest economic achievement, but it is far from finished. Protectionism remains a real break on growth, and I do find it ironic that countries that shout loudly about their commitment to the European project, and um, even occasionally tick off British ministers for their apparent lack of enthusiasm, are sometimes themselves so reluctant to see a deepening of this great success story of European integration. I believe that the single market needs to be both widened and deepened. We need single market rules covering the digital and green economies, and in the services sector, further liberalisation is essential. But we can also achieve a great deal simply by making the existing rules work better, by ensuring that the market functions as it was designed to do. Single market legislation must be properly implemented and properly enforced so that where we have agreed to remove barriers, this is made a reality. In the area of goods and services, and especially of business-to-business -business services, 
Many of the remaining barriers result from the inconsistent implementation and enforcement of current European legislation. Some of this is being addressed. Austria has abolished various residency requirements for service providers in construction, retail and real estate. Denmark has abolished authorization schemes for stockbrokers, auctioneers and shipping agents. France has reformed retail planning conditions and abolished its authorization scheme for opening new hotels. But in Italy, British lecturers are barred from working as English language lecturers. In Portugal, there are minimum distance requirements between driving schools. And in Greece, similar rules uh, on the distance between petrol stations. And these are, these are small <coughs> symptoms of a wider disease. That kind of restriction has no place in a single market worth its name. Member states need to step up efforts to record and tackle trade barriers reported by business, especially by SMEs. And the Commission should increase its challenge of poor enforcement by member states. Working with other member states in the Commission, the UK is stepping up its efforts to ensure that the Services Directive has been properly implemented in all European Union countries. And the estimated total benefit of that work could be worth between four and six billion pounds to the UK economy each year. Second, international <coughs> trade. Now, at a time of economic trouble at home, governments are often tempted towards measures to limit free trade and international competition, and we <coughs> hear those voices now on both sides of the Atlantic. A lurch to protectionism would be a terrible mistake. And the British government will continue to be a champion for free trade, both within the European Union and between the EU and the wider world. We can claim some recent wins. After vigorous personal intervention from the Prime Minister, the September European Council signed off a free trade agreement with South Korea and agreed to offer substantial trade concessions to Pakistan to help her recover from the shattering economic damage wrought by the floods earlier this year. It is estimated that the Korean free trade agreement alone will deliver more than 19 billion euros of opportunities to European goods and services exporters. Other free trade agreements with India, with Canada, with the Mercosur countries of South America are at various stages of negotiation. And I would like to see the EU also give much more of a trade focus to its summit meetings with global economic partners. If we look, for example, at the EU-United States summit that's scheduled for late November, we should be seeking improvements in the work of the Transatlantic Economic Council that governs trade relations between the United States and the European Union. Now, yes, perhaps the idea lacks a certain glamour, and it's a lot less than the North Atlantic free trade area that in an ideal world I would like to see that it would do a lot more good for jobs and for living standards on both sides of the ocean than the grandiloquent but windy phrases that all too often come out of international summits. Also, now more than ever, we need to push for the completion of the Doha development round, which would be worth up to 110 billion pounds to the global economy. 2011, after the midterm elections in the United States, but before the 2012 presidential election in France, represent the best opportunity available to conclude an ambitious, balanced agreement from which all players would benefit. In the search for new sources of growth, Doha would represent a sizable boost to the world economy, as well as confirming the central role of multilateral trade liberalisation throughout the WTO. <coughs> and third, regulation. Europe needs to do more to cut the cost that European regulations impose on business. And this is far from being just a British gripe. Something I found striking about my conversations with ministers in other countries is how our arguments about better, smarter, less complex and less expensive regulation chime with their concerns too. And I'm working with colleagues in other departments here to build alliances in Europe to reduce the burden that regulation imposes on business throughout the European Union. We need to do so, yes, in ways that protect 
our interests, and I think George Osborne and his team, Mark Hogan in particular, deserve real credit for the way in which they have negotiated reasonable compromises over financial supervision uh, and over hedge funds in recent weeks, despite a very difficult negotiating hand which we were bequeathed by our predecessors. And I would add in parenthesis that while I am the first to say when I am going around other European capitals that the financial services and professional centre that is the City of London is a something of huge importance to the United Kingdom. It is also something that is of great value to the European Union as a whole. And I think not just government, but the city itself needs to find ways in which to persuade the rest of Europe that they should see the city as an asset to the entire Union and not just for this country. Now, when he first became president of the Commission, Manuel Barroso set himself an ambition to reduce the cost of European regulation on small and medium-sized enterprises by a quarter. That objective is one that this government wholeheartedly endorses and is encouraging President Barroso to pursue. In this country, we often complain about the European Commission, and there are sometimes very good reasons for those complaints. So it's important also to acknowledge and support those initiatives by the Commission that do encourage enterprise and seek to reduce business costs. And it's worth me pointing out too that at least a Commission proposal for new European legislation must always be accompanied by an impact assessment describing the effect that the proposal will have on business, exactly uh, the same sort of system as we apply to our legislation, both secondary and primary here. But no similar obligation applies automatically to new legislative proposals or legislative amendments coming from either the Council or the European Parliament. And frankly, that is a gap in the EU's arrangements that ought to be put right. Neil mentioned in his introduction that we're approaching some big decisions over the European Union budget, both for 2011 and even more importantly for the new financial perspective. And to be honest, that subject is worth a speech uh, or a seminar in its, in its own right. I would just want to say this, that while the British priorities are going to be to seek uh, vigorous budgetary discipline and restraint and indeed a reduction uh, in the uh, <coughs> sum of EU spending overall, we also do want to see a shift in the priorities within the European Union budget. Europe, in our view, should focus its spending on those areas where the EU acting collectively really can provide some value added in terms of growth, wealth creation, and increased employment. And we would like, therefore, to see a shift away from agricultural spending towards policies to support innovation and enterprise. <coughs> This is not either a speech about the euro and economic governance. Um, suffice it to say, I have no regrets about our country's decision to remain outside the single currency, and I applaud John Major's foresight in negotiating our opt-out. The coalition programme makes it clear that this government will not seek to enter or prepare to enter the euro during the lifetime of this parliament, and we have also committed ourselves to write into law that any proposal by a future British government to join the Euro should be subject to a referendum of the British people. But I want to make it clear too that it is in our national interest that the countries of the Eurozone find a way through their present troubles. British trade, British investments, British holdings in Eurozone financial institutions are all at stake. A renewed financial crisis in the Eurozone would hit jobs and living standards here. That is why George Osborne has been playing an active and constructive part in the discussions of the task force on economic governance, and why we welcome the work that Herman Van Rompuy has done. President Barroso vowed to make the single market the cornerstone of his commission's work. Mario Monti recently completed a report into the functioning of the single market and as 
Anil mentioned uh, Michel Barnier is due tomorrow to publish uh, what he describes as a single market act. We shall certainly be looking forward to that and inspecting the detail of it very closely. <coughs> it's time for all EU member states and the EU institutions to work together to ensure that ambitious declarations and warm words are turned into practical change on the ground that will boost competitiveness, enterprise and growth throughout our continent. President Barroso's ambition to relaunch the single market provides an opportunity to demonstrate to the world that the EU will now focus its energies wholeheartedly on improving its competitiveness. The counterfactual scenario in which the EU returns to yet more divisive debates and proposals on social and employment legislation or resorts to short-term protectionist remedies would mean seriously dampened economic prospects continuing high levels of unemployment and a further erosion of competitiveness and prosperity. As both businesses and citizens right across Europe struggle with the consequences of the economic crisis, it is more important than ever that the EU creates the economic conditions necessary for growth and a barrier-free environment that increases consumer confidence. But in conclusion, I should note that one of the reasons the single market has not delivered to its full potential is that too many of us, and this I apply to people right around Europe, think that it is just the responsibility of Brussels to drive it forward. That may have been true at the start, and the EU institutions do still have a crucial role to play, most importantly in ensuring a vigorous competition framework. But the responsibility for ensuring that the single market framework is translated into real rights and opportunities for businesses and citizens lies also at the national and the local levels. And in that sense, the challenge of strengthening growth in Europe belongs to all of us. Thank you very much indeed. Q&A, time for q and I've got to be, be away in they're going to be in a way about 15 minutes' time. Right. Okay, yes, sir. Um, great vision. Uh, it's really pleased to hear your comments about public debt. Um, during my career, you know, the EU they have tripled without a lot of obvious benefit. But you put your finger up on a central problem is this decline in the working age or imminent decline in the working population. Mm. It's very fundamental. And we can't expect GDP growth to take more than um, productivity while that's happening. But I, I dispute your comment about Greece. It wasn't the EU or the IMF which made the reform. It was the financial markets who said, enough, we're not lending any more. They acted uh, and decisively forced those policy changes. We in this country only just and had the Chancellor, the coalition government, not taken the steps they had. We have a big sterling crisis now. My question really to you is, you talked about not being in the euro. We are now down 25% in February in terms of the past two years, to start actually about a month ago, now down another three percent. When do you expect the rest of Europe to start complaining about the valuation? They're not. It's a good question. They're not doing so yet. Um, I mean, it uh, may have. I think they've got enough problems in the eurozone without complaining about about sterling. Um, and of course, one of the things that the crisis of the eurozone has done is. Um, in practice, I think it's put off the date at which those countries, which one might describe as the not yet ins, yeah. um, you know, hope to join. And Estonia has managed to, to get approval to join the euro. As in Poland, uh, about two weeks before last, and um, the Polish minister was saying, they were, yes, we, you know, we're, still, we're still up for this. Um, but I think you know, they can see that the time frame to live on that ambition is going to be going to be uh, longer than they had hoped. And I think it is true that a number of countries do see this entry. It, it's it's part it's sort of a badge of honour that we're full members of the of the club, which is not something that has ever really been shared in in this country. No, we've got to watch out for it. But I I think a number of you know I think I suspect they haven't said this to me. I suspect there are a number of ministers and certainly businesses around Europe who wish they had the flexibility uh, of currency to, to, to respond to market conditions that we still enjoy. And I think that the, the critique 
that we made of the euro is to having tried to have a one size, the one in level of interest rate to fit very divergent economies without you know, an equalization mechanism, transfer payments, and so on, um, that the sort of United States has. Um, was inevitably going to uh, create severe strains. And I, I, I think we've got to avoid Schadenfreude over this because it, it doesn't help us when they're in these straits. And I do think that the political will to maintain the euro is so powerful that they are they are determined to find a way to get it. I don't believe the pundits who say the, the, the euro is going to go to fall apart, um, but we, we it really do. Um, want them to, to find the, the mechanisms to succeed. I think having a form of permanent crisis resolution uh, mechanism, um, yeah, whether or not that requires treaty change, we, we may get a better idea on in a few days' time. But that the getting a mechanism, I think, is, is an important part of that. Um, uh, yes, and then we're back. Okay, uh, I, I, well, it's very stimulating. I agree with very much what you said. Um, I think your argument is slightly undermined by your um, emphasis on the debt hole. Looking at today's FT, um, which shows as a percentage of GDP, the government's debt burden uh, in 2010, 71%, you know, and Ireland, France, Greece, etc., way above. But I mean, I just think it's worth, I think you're actually referring to the structural deficit on the overall debt burden, it's worth bringing that out. Then the second point is that developing nations always have scope because they, their economies are so inefficient but fast productivity. Well, I think comparing us adverse with it is not entirely fair. I mean, I think it's good. I think actually the, the Latin America, uh, India, <coughs> and China's growth is going to be, it, they're always going to go fast and ask them to get the market. I would take slight issue on the fact that Europe's becoming a museum <laughs> because this is exactly the point that was made. I remember in about 1990, I was giving talks on the single market, and, and all the business schools were saying, <coughs> um, well, Europe's going to be the museum, um, the United States is going to be the bread basket, and Japan is going to be the workshop of the world. It didn't work out that way. Um, but I would be very interested to have your further comments on the exact mechanism of the sector strategies. I think actually it's the exact key to growth in Europe, cooperation on things like defence, um, energy, um, aviation, etc. I think there's a lot of scope there, and I think it would make Europe really powerful. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the stru structural debt, I mean, is the important element because that's the bit the cycle isn't going to iron uh, uh, out. Emerging economy, yeah, but I made the point of saying, you know, it's not just the emerging economies, it's the United States as well. If it were just the emerging economies, um, you know, we might you know, be, be, a, be a little less worried than we, we ought to be. But when the most developed economy in the world is surging ahead of us, creating jobs in a way Europe is not improving its competitiveness despite the emerging economy challenge, then I think we have cause to be worried. You know, your final point about the sector... You know the US is a special case of equipment, money, etc. But have you got another developed economy? Well, the US is a Well, I think if you look at... Um, if you look at some other... Some other European economies that you're doing... doing well, so yeah, you're, well, I mean, the argument would be that the other, the other anglosphere... Um, because you know, Australia, we can Australia's you know, there's, there's, there's mineral prices have quite a bit to do with uh, Australia's <laughs> Australia's growth. And um, your sectoral, your sectoral um, point. Yes, I mean en energy seems to me is very important. I mean we don't have a single market in energy. We ought to have a single market in energy. It's actually not the UK that's uh, the country that uh, is, is is blocking progress uh, there. If we go a single market in energy, um, it will. There will be more efficient allocation of resources. It will mean um, uh, that uh, we build in gains in terms of energy conservation. Over the longer term, we will help energy security uh, as we make our own energy uh, sector more efficient. That quite appeals to some of the Eastern European <coughs> countries who are acutely aware of their dependence on Russian gas and oil at the moment. I mean, defence is always going to be trickier, um, but you know, as you know, there are some very <coughs> intensive talks going on between ourselves and the French at the moment about enhanced defence cooperation. So that sector is not going to be exempt at all. Um, 
digital, uh, Commissioner Nelly Croes has come out with some very ambitious papers on that, which I think will, you know, quibble over some of the detail, but it will benefit both business uh, and um, consumer rights as well, if you're able to get redress against uh, an online seller from anywhere inside the EU. Um, I mean, energy seems to be, energy and further services seem to me to be the two really big, big prizes there. What we, we have to get is you know, the initiatives right from the, the Commission. I'd like to see Barroso and the, the like minded, the real free market minded commissioners, rediscover the boldness that they displayed in Barroso's first term. But I, you know, without wanting to be rude, but I think I think has ebbed a little bit um, uh, in, in, in the last couple of years. Um, but then it does also mean persuading, you know, other member states that they they need to do this. Uh, you know, energy, you know, I mean, Germany has a particular relationship with Russia. Um, very interesting test case at the moment going on. The Commission is taking action against Gazprom over um, the pipeline in Poland. They're trying to insist that Gazprom, if it's operating within EU territory, has to be subject to EU competition and state aid rules. Uh, and that is, a, that is a very, very interesting test case indeed, that's still, still uh, ongoing. Um, so there's somebody there first, then I'll go on. Yeah, thank you. Jonathan Horseman, um, you set out some stats about uh, the Commission's uh, investment in energy and energy efficiency and so on. Um, you set out some stats about the UK's, the importance of the UK's ties with existing EU member states. Can you say something about the importance that the uh, UK government attaches to de developing ties with aspirant EU member states and what position yeah. you take within discussions with your European partners about strengthening those ties with the Eastern Neighbourhood yeah. programme? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the um, I said there are three categories. I mean, the Brit British government um, has a, a, a very clear view on enlargement. Um, we believe that membership of the European Union should be the right of any country which is European which wants to join and which can meet the accession criteria in its case. Um, we don't agree with those of our colleagues who say they want to pause or a stop after Croatian accession that's expected next year. Um, there are actually four categories. So Iceland is sort of in a category of its own if it does pursue its, uh, its application. Uh, but the three are Western Balkans, where it seems to me that it is the prospect of EU membership is the single most important driver of both economic and democratic reform in that part of Europe. And I was talking about economics this week. If I, even more than the single market, if you ask me to say, look, what's the one thing that the EU has achieved? It's a real plus in the credit balance. And I would actually say it is cementing democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in those parts of Europe, whether it's the Iberian Peninsula or Greece or Central Europe where those traditions and values were completely crushed by um, fascism, communism, or civil conflict for most of the 20th century. And that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, the, the Western Balkans, um, Eastern neighborhood is very interesting. I've been to Moldova, Ukraine, and um, Azerbaijan in the last few weeks. Um, the politics of all those countries is incredibly difficult. And what we have to insist upon with the Balkans and with these countries is that there are no shortcuts in terms of meeting the accession criteria. There's got to be genuine economic change. There's also got to be genuine political change. I said to the Ukrainians in particular, and Van that is the, the human rights, independent courts, um, these are not uh, optional extra. So these are central European values. They are written into clauses of uh, free trade agreements. They are written into clauses of association agreements. They are a condition for membership. You, know, you choose not to go down that path, but um, it's up to you. But we've got to be absolutely rigorous in enforcing accession criteria, insisting upon those. And we don't want to get into you know, another sort of case where, as happened in Romania and Bulgaria, they came, became full members and then there's still arguments going on afterwards as to whether they've met the accession character. I mean, that, that just makes a dif difficult relationships um, and we mustn't have, have, have that repeated. 
The other, the other third, third one is, is Turkey. Um, and you know, we've been very clear um, that uh, I think it's in, in both the EU's interests and in Turkey's interests that Turkey is uh, uh, admitted uh, as a member if that's what she wants to and can meet the accession criteria. I mean, it's not going to happen next year. Um, I think it's not going to happen um, with all the will in the world for quite some years to come. Turkish growth um, is, um, well, annualised rate for the first few months of this year, compared to the previous year, was about 12, 11, 12%. Uh, it's by far the fastest growing economy in Europe. Um, it has also got political leverage in regions of the world where, which we can use to our advantage. You know, if you're looking for a role model for the Arab or Central Asian street, I would much rather be looking at Mr. Erdogan or Mr. Ahmadinejad. And so I think maintaining <coughs> Turkey's Western orientation is a vital to geostrategic interest as well as something that gives us great economic opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm Andrew? Yes. Uh, so at the summit later this week, what would you see as the most important things that the government to um, raise in Britain's entry? The, the things that I know are on, well, I know what's on the agenda for the summit, um, and the things that are going to be in our interests, had it not, leaving aside the Franco General present that we're going to have to deal with there, are going to be uh, sorting out the, with the Iran sanctions approval we have to give. Uh, they will be dealing with the reference of Serbia's membership application to the Commission. For, for, for detailed analysis of what they need to do. I think that will go through, and I think that is valuable for reasons I just gave to Jonathan. Um, then they will be dealing with the agendas for the summits with the United States, with Russia, and with Ukraine. Uh, they will, and I, I hope they will give a firm trade-related focus to those. I hope they will have some language in the communicate about Doha. I hope they will come to an agreement on uh, the approach to Cancun, around the talks on climate change, but I think the sun is, is now going to be dominated by a discussion about economic governance and the Franco-German proposal for treaty change. Uh, I believe that, as I said earlier, it is in our national interest that the Eurozone finds a way to deal with its troubles, and that includes having a permanent crisis resolution mechanism in which the international markets can have confidence. And one of the arguments the Germans make very strongly is that uh, they believe the treaty basis, the legal basis in terms of their own constitutional law of the temporary arrangement is risky and that in any case could not be continued beyond 2013. Now there's an argument about whether what they are proposing is the right way to address an acknowledged problem or is not, and this is something the Prime Minister is personally very engaged in now, uh, and will be engaged in at the at the summit. Um, and I don't think there's any secret about the fact that um, you know we've not been we're not sort of filled with enthusiasm at the prospect of uh, new treaty change, but we're going to look at you know the proposals that uh, come forward from Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy. Um, we haven't seen uh, as yet you know, a, a detailed version of what is being proposed. That, I think that, that is going to be uh, the, uh, the way forward. Um, what we're quite clear about, Andrew, is that um, as is written into the coalition programme, the British government is not going to agree to any treaty change that transferred powers from the United Kingdom to European institutions. I have one, one very quickly, and I'm just going. Yes, I was going to ask, well, what's your view on the European financial reform agenda? Because, um, you know, nobody can disagree with the intention of a lot of this stuff, which is to make the system uh, safer. But the, there is a view that there's a, there's a subtext there which is to deprive the UK of its most successful uh, industry. Or yes. I, mean, yeah, we, I, mean, yeah, we, I mean, if you're going to have a single market across European financial services, you need to have a some sort of structure of European financial services regulation. Otherwise, you, you know, you, you're going to invite regulatory arbitrage from one jurisdiction to another within the single market. Um, and the city has no problem with that as a principle. Um, what we have to do measure by measure 
is to make sure that we don't uh, end up with, with, with legislation which does what you rightly fear, which is play to those um, you know, who would much rather that the, uh, the, the financial services um, shifted more of their activities to other capitals within Europe, or indeed those who frankly don't care about Europe being a financial services center at all. I mean, it is absolutely at the top of George Osborne's um, list, along with the budget, to protect the uh, the City of London as a and the financial services and professional industry associated with it as a vital part of the British uh, economy, generator of wealth and of jobs here. But I do <coughs> think, okay, back to what I said earlier, I do think that not just not just the government, the city collectively needs to be much more adept than it is at the moment about explaining to other Europeans why the city is an asset for them as well. And when I've been to, I think, one East European country I was in recently where I had made my pitch and my brief about asking for support on the hedge funds directive. And the minister said to me, it always, we know that's very important for you. And he was pretty unbriefed on it. It was not of interest to him. He didn't have any awareness that this might be a European asset that was at risk. I was at a meeting with the Prime Minister of Romania where he was describing to me his legislative program for privatization and public-private partnerships. And I said, well, yeah, you, where are you going to get the expertise to help you deliver that um, with the knowledge and the capability to do it well, come to London and do, and, and do that. You know, it's an asset for Romania as well as for the UK. And we've got government, city and partnerships to do, get much better at selling that case. Um, you very, very, very consistent with you. Um, I always thought people think of Europe as a sort of subject, and it's not. There's this whole extra level of government. And the problem is yeah. you then have to not only master your own brief, but every other single brief in government, basically. Um, so you're across all of these things. Um, thank you for your time. Great to um, have you here. And I think we should thank you in the conventional way. Thank you.